Will the congregation please rise? Thank you. You may be seated. Uh, brothers and sisters, we welcome you here today for the funeral services of Vermont, William Monty Evans. Um, to keep this meeting sacred, we ask that uh, you will silence your cell phones at this time. Uh, my name is Brother Clayton Harrison, uh, and I will be conducting this service today. Um, prior to the beginning of these services, the family prayer was offered by Don Evans, a brother-in-law to Monty. Um, for today's services, we'd like to thank Michelle Seacott for playing the piano and, for, and Karen Finch for leading the music. And we will now begin by, uh, with an invocation from Reed Christensen, a father-in-law. Our kind and eternal Heavenly Father, we bow our heads here at the commencement of this funeral for Monty Evans, thanking Thee for the opportunity to have known him, and I for one, not only as a son-in-law, but as a friend and a confidant. Appreciated him, and certainly hope and pray that his family, especially my daughter Tamara, might be comforted and uh, guided and directed in the things that she is to do. We are grateful for the opportunity to have the gospel in our lives and to understand it for what it is and what it means to all of us in the future. Be with us in every regard and know that there might be peace and kindness in the family abode with all of us. We humbly pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, 
uh, the services will proceed as follows. First, we will have a talk from Bev McMaster, Monty's mother. Following her, there will be a special musical number, or a musical number from Brennan and Jamie Show Scow with their children. Following the musical number, there will be a talk by Andrea Evans, Monty's sister. Following her, there will be another musical number by Michelle Seacott, Monty's sister. Following that talk, uh, musical number, we will hear from Brennan Scow, Monty's uh, son. And we will go to that point. I've actually been asked to give a, a life sketch. Otherwise, we would be here for a very long time. I'm grateful to have the honor and the true blessing to be Monty's mother. He has been a blessing in my life from the moment he was born. He was born on June 19, 1969 in Salt Lake City to Beverly and Jack Evans. At the time, we were living at 1666 Harvard Avenue which was just up the street from President Nelson and his growing family. At the time, Monty's father was in law school at the University of Utah. Monty enjoyed the companionship of his big brother, David, and David loved and watched over Monty. In 1972, we were living in Houston when Monty's baby brother, Justin, was born. In 1975, his sister, Andrea, followed by 1977 by his sister Elizabeth. He loved baseball and played on little league teams, both in Houston and in Orem. He also enjoyed swimming and swam in summer leagues. In 1978, his parents were divorced and he moved to Orem, Utah with his mother and brothers and sisters. This was to be close to Grandpa Ray, his mother's father. Grandpa was a steadying force in his life, as well as the entire family. Grandpa taught him how to work and attended his little league baseball games. He really loved being with Grandpa. He played ping pong with Grandpa. Grandpa won all the time. <laughs> Other games in Grandpa's basement included hide and seek. But every Saturday, we went to Grandpa's to weed in the garden. In the fall, we picked up branches and took them to the burn pile because Grandpa had two and a half acres of apple orchard, and he pruned them and cared for them carefully. In 1981, while living at 1023 North, 600 East in Orem, Monty's stepfather, Bruce, entered the picture. I might add here that Bruce McMaster is our family's hero. In 1982, Monty's sister Michelle was born. He loved taking her for walks in her stroller. Mom loved, Monty loved scouting. He was so excited to join Cub Scouts and loved wearing his uniform with all the ranks and achievements and insignias. When he was old enough to join the Boy Scouts, he was all in. His scoutmaster, Ken Harris and his wife Barbara made him a great scout, at he, which he achieved Eagle at the age of 13. He kept on earning merit badges after that and earned two palms. He was selected to join Order of the Arrow, an honor society of the Boy Scouts of America. He attended Canyon View Junior High School. Now you might think that that's where he met Tammy since she went to that school too but he was actually dating her sister. <laughs> in junior high, he discovered music and started playing the trumpet, which continued through high school. He played in the pit for Orem High's plays. I can't remember which plays they were, but he was in the pit. He graduated from Orem High School in 1987. In 1988, he entered the MTC. That's a missionary training center for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was to serve a Spanish-speaking mission to Argentina. In those days, and by the way, his last and fourth sister, Rebecca, was born while he 
was in the MTC. But back in those days, which you can't do now, you could take treats to the MTC and, and have them taken to the missionary that you, that you loved. So I baked some chocolate chip cookies, and I loaded the baby in the car. It was just her, me, and the cookies. We went to the MTC. We drove up out in front where the portico is, and Monty was standing right there with a bunch of other missionaries waiting for a, a shuttle bus. He recognized our car. His eyes got big. He looked around like he knew he wasn't supposed to leave the group, and he walked up to the car. I put the window down. He looked in. He saw the baby. He looked at me, and I said, come on. So he came in and sat down and held baby Becky for two whole minutes. <laughs> then he released her with a big smile and left the car to join the other missionaries. He returned from his mission to Cordoba, Argentina in 1990, speaking fluent Spanish. You might think so. Well, it's a miracle because in high school, his Spanish teacher called me in one day and said, I need to talk to you about Mont. I said, yeah, he's getting a C, right? And he goes, mm, well, right this minute, he is. They're two weeks into the term. He said, I suggest you put him in basket weaving or something. I said, really? And he said, he's going to fail. You don't, you know, I don't, I hate to give him an F. He's such a cute kid. And I said, okay. They didn't have basket weaving, so I put him in ceramics. <laughs> so when he was finished with his mission, he spoke Spanish so well that the natives thought he was a native. In 1990, he enrolled at BYU with a major in family science and a minor in Spanish. He enjoyed extracurricular activities at the Y. He sang in the men's choir and actually had a solo in the choir when they performed in the Provo Tabernacle. That's the same tabernacle which later was gutted by fire and rebuilt into the Provo City Center Cemetery. He also performed in the Fourth of July parades with the folk dancers. He graduated from BYU in 1994. Monty met and married Elizabeth Wright I don't think she was quite right. They divorced a year later. <laughs> he met his eternal sweetheart and best friend, Tammy Christensen, at Converges, where they both were working. They married in 1991, excuse me, 2001, and they were sealed in the Mount Timpanocos Temple in 2005. Monty was thrilled to be a stepfather to Tammy's seven-year-old son, Brennan. He loved Brennan and tried to be a good father to him. I sometimes worried because he teased Brenda a lot. And I thought, oh, I hope this works out. But it did work out. He taught him the gospel of Jesus Christ and tried sincerely to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He studied the scriptures and used them to guide his life. Monty knew that discipleship is not about doing th things perfectly. It's about doing things intentionally. We grow and learn through adversity, and Monty had a lot of adversity. He had many, many health issues for the past 10 years or more. He had gastroparesis and was on constant pain. For the last several years, he was on oxygen constantly. He was diagnosed with bipolar. In spite of all his health issues, he lived close to the spirit and kept a good attitude. He lived with a testimony that every trial you've been through is necessary for your salvation. My dear son, Vermont William Evans, Monty, passed away and went through the veil on August 9th, 2022. I know he's happy. I know he's with my dad. I know that the Lord loves us all and that we can all be together again. Thank goodness for Jesus Christ, who has atoned for all of us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. God. 
stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displayed. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great Thou art! Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul, my Savior. honored to be able to talk about Monty today because Monty was a one-of-a-kind human being. Um, there was no one else quite like him and he told it like it, what, like it is. He didn't mess around, he just 
He told it like it was. And so today I want to share some of his great qualities with you. And so the first quality I would mention is that Monty had a great sense of humor. And <clears throat> to be honest, as his little sister, most of that sense of humor was kind of centered around teasing you. But he actually teased most people. If he liked you, you probably got teased a little bit. And so he liked to also tease and he liked to shock people a little bit with, with the way he was. Our sister Becky remembers him being silly with him and joking around, and always Monty made, him, made her laugh. And one of the things that you, if you remember it about being with Monty, is oftentimes he would come up and he would just do this. Is this annoying you? Have I annoyed you yet? And he would sit and poke at you until he'd get a reaction out of you. So Michelle remembers him as nothing but love and laughter. They even at some point um, dropped the, the, na the, the use of using names, and they just called each other brother and sister. And that was such a Monty thing to do. One of his other great qualities is he was very talented. Um, he had a great love for music. And when we were young, he and I had bedrooms right next to each other. And one of his gifts was he loved to play the trumpet. And so my frustration as my room next to him is he liked to practice at 1030 at night because he had a busy day and you know, high school homework going around. So at 1030 at night, all of a sudden, I would start hearing his, doing his scales on his trumpet. And I'm trying to get to sleep. Got an early day. I always had to be to school really early in the morning. And I remember going in one night and just saying, do you think that you could stop I have a really early morning tomorrow or at least play softer? And he just looked at me and he just started playing louder. <laughs> and I was, I, you, you learned that if you, if you really wanted him to stop, the last thing you should do is ask him to stop. So, but he was very talented with his trumpet. And like mom said, he, he was in plays. Um, he danced as a folk dancer at BYU and he love the fine arts. One of his other talents was that Monty was an out-of-the-box thinker. He was very smart, um, but he always came at things kind of from his own angle. He loved computers, and he would often build his own computers for himself and for other people. And he worked in technical support for years and was very, very good at it. He, and he had his own twist on things. And he was great at solving problems with his computer and things like this. But he was also an out-of-the-box thinker about solving problems. And I just have to share this one funny story. So every summer, we would go and stay with our dad, who lived down in Houston. And I remember being in our house in Torrington Court, and we were all around the table for dinner. And our stepmother, Debbie, who always provided such great meals for us, uh, I remember I'd made Kool-Aid that night. It was Lizzie and I's job to always make Kool-Aid and have drinks on the table. And Monty happened to spill some of his red Kool-Aid on the table. And um, Debbie looked at it. He was sitting next to Debbie, and Debbie says, you need to clean that up. And he's like, OK, sorry. And he leans down, and he slurped up all the Kool-Aid off the table, just right there with his mouth. And Debbie was just like shocked because she was very prim and proper. And of course, she wanted him to use his napkin. And he was just like, what? I cleaned it up. <laughs> and he was an out-of-the-box out thinker. And I, I'll never forget that and the shock on Debbie's face. It, was, it makes me laugh every time I think about it. So, but hey. Fix the situation. He's a, he fixed it. Monty was also very fun and happy. He was a happy person. And as kids, we played a lot together when we were young. We often played badminton and croquet in the backyard. That was a very standard thing to, for us to do in the summer. Also, every Sunday, we did go to Grandpa's house. We loved going to Grandpa's house. And most of the time, we ended up in the basement playing ping pong, and we'd had, we would have epic battles of playing ping pong. Um, one year, Monty got his own ping pong paddle because grandpas weren't the best. Sometimes the, you know how the rubber part kind of can flap away from the wood. So they weren't always the best paddles. And he got this spongy paddle for Christmas one year. And for some reason, he had heard that if you lick 
the whole paddle, it's a little more tacky and sticky and you could get a better spin on the ball. And so he was great with his ping pong paddle and of course we were never allowed to use it. So, because he thought that was his ace in the hole. So, um, we also loved to play in the apple orchard. And we would run and round and play hide and seek and climb in the trees. And it used to drive Grandpa crazy because we would go and we'd pick one apple. It was so the best to shine an apple on your shirt and just take one, you know, that first bite. is so awesome and crispy. And then we'd kind of throw the apple and <laughs> we'd go to the next tree. And so Grandpa would find all of these apples in the apple orchard with just one bite out of them. And maybe it was just me that did that, but I thought everybody did that. <laughs> I think Monty did it too, but we loved playing in the orchard and playing hide and go seek and we loved irrigation day because the front yard would fill up with water. If you remember, we'd swing on this, the big tire swing and the yard would be full of water and um, I remember one time we were running through the ditches full of water and Monty didn't notice that the gate was down on one of the ditches and he ran right into him right where his, um, his shins were and I think mom thought he broke both his legs and he was howling it up. We weren't allowed to play in the ditches anymore after that. <laughs> but we still ran around on, on irrigation day and I remember just splashing around with Monty and Justin and Lizzie and our cousins. We would do that and have so much fun. Um, Monty was also a great gamer and he and Tammy would even play together and even before he had a, he had a group of friends they called the Guild um, with his games. We played board games. And we didn't play board games like most families played board games, which I found out once I got married. I thought everybody did this. But we would play till 3 or 4 in the morning, and we would have epic battles. And we would go over to Uncle Mark's or Aunt Karen's, and we had especially loved to play Risk and Acquire. And these games could go on for like 3 and 4 hours, but it didn't bother us, and we loved playing board games together. And it was just... To me, it's part of my childhood, and it was just one of the fun things that we did. Um, also, Monty is a very genuine person, and I think one of the things that's awesome as I would talk to people is everybody kind of had their own unique relationship with him because he was genuine with each person and met them where they were at. And Monty was great at looking you in the eye and really listening. Justin and Monty used to go to the movies once a week, like clockwork, Justin said, and after they would just sit out in the parking lot and eat leftover popcorn and just talk. Um, I remember one day being at his house. I was helping him with a few things, and he asked, he said, sit down. He's like, how are you doing? And I proceeded to tell him all about my children. I told him what Jake was doing and Kenzie and Gabe, and he's like, well, okay, that's great, but how are you doing? And that really struck me, that he really saw me, and he cared about me, and he wanted to know how I was doing. Um, one of the other great qualities about Monty is he was very thoughtful and kind. And I asked Justin what he remembered about Monty, and this is what he said. He said, Monty always showed kindness, love, and respect, and he was the first to give anyone a hug. Um, Monty was always thinking about those he loved and how he could show them kindness. One day I had taken Monty to um, some, he was, hadn't been feeling well and we had gone to an appointment and afterwards we were going shopping to get him some things that he needed. And while we were there, he says, oh wait, I need to get Tammy a treat. And he was always thinking of you. And he says, we need to find some chocolate and ice cream. And so he, he was always thinking of Tammy and how he could bless her and make sure that she knew that he loved her. Um, Monty was also a great missionary, and he was very thoughtful and kind and loving and serving of the people of Buenos Aires. He would write letters, and I remember I would write him letters. Mom had these special arrow mail that you folded up into thirds and um, that we used to use for back in the 80s, early 90s, I don't know. And I would write letters all about what new boy I thought was cute at school. And he'd always write back, and I loved it. And, but I remember a mom would write him letters, and she would, number one, and she would write a question, and she'd write all these questions, and we got back this letter of number one, yes. <laughs> number two, sometimes. <laughs> number three, and mom was like, what was question number one? <laughs> and that was a very Monty thing to do, to just have these quick answers where you were left going, 
I don't even know what question number one was. And um, after that, I think you photocopied your letters before you sent them off to him. <laughs> Lizzie remembers that when he came home from his mission, she went down and sat on his bed while he was unpacking and telling, him, telling her all about his experiences in Argentina. And then all of a sudden he pulled out his mate cup and his mate straw. These were his prize souvenirs from Argentina and became a huge part of his life. He drank mate like every day, all day. Always had a mate cup going. He loved his mate, um, but he was a great missionary. Um, one of the final qualities that I would talk about is his great faith in our Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, he knew that he knew that his Savior was his brother. And even through all of his struggles, he never doubted that. Um, he did have a lot of trials, and he did suffer, but he never lost that faith in the gospel and in our Savior. He blessed his family with that faith. And um, he knew that there was more than just this life. Brennan, he loved being your dad. Benny and Leah and Wesley and Peter, he loved being your TT. He loved that very much. And Tammy, he loves you fiercely and with loyalty, so much loyalty to you. And I know that through Jesus Christ, he knew that he would be able to have a clear mind and a healthy body and that he could live with you in the eternities. I too am a believer and I know that our Savior Jesus Christ lives. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.
Hi. Hi, Monty's son. Hi, thanks, Darren. Hi, thanks, Matthias. Uh, my wife and I, who complimented, my wife was the one right here, in case you didn't know. She's really great. We text each other pictures of our kids and quotes. Of our, I mean, if you have kids, I'm sure that's not uncommon. Uh, recently, though, um, we've, I don't know if I should speak for myself only. I have been feeling like it's a real tragedy that not everyone in the world gets to know my kids the way I know my kids. Not everyone in the world gets to know two-year-old Wesley, which if you have a chance to know two-year-old Wesley, you really should. He's a delight. And same with seven-year-old Benny and five-year-old Leah and I mean, six-month-old Peter doesn't have much. That's right, weeks, not months. Months was way more fun than weeks. Uh, and we, we say this to each other back and forth because you know, if you think the, of the percentage of the population that gets to know two-year-old Wesley as a dad, it's really small. And that gets to know two-year-old Wesley at all, it's really small. And it's a real, real tragedy that the percentage of people that got to know Monty as a dad was one person on the whole planet. You all missed out a lot. Uh, it was tumultuous and special and good. The first time I met Monty, um, I think I was six because uh, my mom and Monty started dating in October and then got married in May? January. January. Oh, so I'm, oh no, I was six, yeah. I was six, and my recollection of this event is probably not accurate because I was six, and so my mom's probably going to be shaking her head at me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to fix the story though, because it's way more funny the way I tell it, I think. We were supposed to have dinner, and I remember, I can't remember the restaurant, but we got there, and there was no Monty. And my mom is, where's Monty? Where's Monty? That's what my mom does. She's this person. Couldn't get a hold of him on the phone. Um, I mean, you know, it was 2001, so did phones even exist? I'm not really sure. Uh, <laughs> so we went to his apartment, and I'm sure this isn't actually what happened, but my recollection is that my mom just opened the door. Um, and there was Monty playing Diablo 1 in his underwear. <laughs> and he never changed. That was, that's Monty. And I'm glad he never changed, you know, because I was six. And... That's a pretty six-year-old thing to do. And it was special that he was willing to meet me at six. We often say he stayed at six. So as I grew up, he stayed six, which isn't true. I mean, we had lots of really mature conversations that you have as you're a teenager, you know, when you need help. And you start dealing with big stuff. You start dealing with the idea that your friends can reject you. You, can, you start dealing with the idea that your dad can reject you. You start dealing with the idea that maybe you're a little more alone than you want because you don't necessarily have siblings right next to you. He was there for all of it. And it's a tragedy that you guys couldn't experience that because it was really special. He taught me what it really meant to hold the priesthood and exercise it in service of my fellow man and my family. He taught me that the beauty of the earth, all of it, denotes that there is a God and that that God loves us. Um, he taught me that suffering is an important part of life in general and it's an important part of perfection and it's an important part of growth. Um, on Friday, I <clears throat> went on a hike. He, we lived in Springville, and in Springville, there's um, 
We call it the white rock. I think it's a limestone deposit. I don't really know what it is, but you hike there sometimes. And uh, he showed it to me probably when I was like eight. I mean, we moved to the house up on the hill. I guess I was nine when we moved there, right? So around the time I was nine, and he, he, we, we hiked up there, and we did that a lot. We hiked up to that spot a lot. And when it would rain, you could dig into the limestone and get nice, soft, wet limestone, and we would make rocks out of it, and then they would dry, and they would be limestone rocks. And I hadn't done it in a long time, you know, and I, I have four kids and a job and a wife, and I'm taking care of my mom and stepdad. I don't get a lot of time to hike, but it felt fitting that that be something I do for him. And I went on this, this hike, and I had a distinct memory. We were hiking. There's this, there's a specific part of the hike that's kind of like a roller coaster. You kind of go up, and then you level out a little bit, and then you go up again. And he had bad knees. Monty always had horrible knees, as long as I could remember. And uh, I remember we were walking this part, and he starts singing because that's what Monty does. He's a, he sings. He started singing, I like pain, yes I do, I like pain, how about you? And, you know, as a kid, I was like, whatever, Monty, you're silly. But that was really his approach to life. Pain was sacred to him. And for the last 13 years, he had a lot of pain. And it was hard to watch, but I know he didn't always feel that way. I mean, sometimes. He was not a poor wayfaring man of grief. He was a fighter and a warrior, and that's how I'm going to remember him, as a warrior and someone who loves people. And you guys should all do the same, because he'd be really bummed out to know that we stayed sad for him. Thanks. Love you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. A few years ago, as I was reading a book, there was a line that stood out to me, and it has made a great impression on me. The line was this, I thought of sunsets and fall leaves and how they're even more beautiful when they're dying. Since then, as I've watched sunsets and as I've looked at fall leaves, I've asked myself, what makes them more beautiful when they're dying? They're beautiful because of all that they represent. A day or a season full of joys. They represent days full of goodness and love. They represent a life well lived. In the sunset of Monty's life, there was beauty in the courage that he showed as he faced all of his challenges. There was beauty in the faith that he exercised, a faith that he developed as he trusted in Christ, a faith that grew as he struggled through all of his health challenges. Through them all, he moved forward with a faith that all of his challenges would be made okay because of Jesus Christ. My mom used to say, I'd gladly give up two hours in the evening for one in the morning. As beautiful as sunsets and fall leaves are, nothing compares to the beauty in a sunrise or the green of budding trees. Not so much because of the beauty of them, but because of the hope that comes with them. The dawning of a new day with all the joys the springing forth of new life with all the promise. 53 is not that old, but Monty was just given up two hours in the evening to get a jump start on the morning of the resurrection. I know that as he passed through the veil, that he had a glorious reunion. A glorious reunion with his loved ones. A glorious reunion with Jesus. And I know it was glorious because Jesus Christ is glorious. He is the sunrise and the sunset. He is the Alpha and Omega. Because he is love personified. Simply because he is 
We are all promised glorious reunion with our husbands, with our wives, with our sons, with our daughters, with our brothers, with our sisters, with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we would like to thank all who participated in these services. And we'd like to also thank the Grandview 15th Ward Relief Society who will be providing a family luncheon following the graveside services. Um, the pallbearers are Brennan Scow, Monty's son, and Dave Evans, a brother. Don Evans, a brother-in-law, and Jake Evans, a nephew. Brett Wadsworth and Matthias Seacoat, uh, brothers-in-laws. Uh, the flower bearers were Bethany and Magnolia Scow, Monty's granddaughters. And honorary Paul bearers are Justin Evans and J.P. Evans, brothers. Darren, Myron, and Gary Christensen, brother-in-laws. Wesley Scow and Peter Scow, Monty's grandsons. Um, the interment will be at the Orem City Cemetery. Um, and we invite the, you to remain seated following the closing hymn and prayer until you're directed to stand. And uh, we will now have a closing hymn, I Need Thee Every Hour, after which uh, Bruce McMaster, Monty's stepfather, will offer the benediction.
Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before Thee at this hour and offer our gratitude for sharing in the life of Monty Evans and learning from his example and the way he lived. We pray that we may go forward from this day and try to emulate the teachings of the gospel in our lives. And we thank thee for every blessing that we've been given. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. And we now invite the pallbearers to come up, come forward. Will the congregation please rise? We invite the family to follow. This concludes these services. Thank you.